Welcome to the Balance Protocol Podcast. If you are looking to regain your health, get the most out of life, or even resolve a chronic disease that has been plaguing you for years, this is the place. During an era where countless people are feeling the weight of ill health and whose heads are spinning due to all the noise and confusion within the info space, Dr. Beck is here to cut through all that noise and misinformation. To bridge the gap between medicine, scientific research, and where everything should truly be centered, within you. Backed with two decades of professional clinical experience, Dr. Beck applies a revolutionary systems biology called functional medicine, utilizing his powerful method called the Balance Protocol. Here, Dr. Beck will educate you on the root causes of disease, motivate you to take solid corrective actions in your life, and inspire you to reach the highest levels of well-being. He knows that at the end of the day, it is you, the patient, who holds the keys to your ultimate health and well-being. It's time for The Balance Protocol with Dr. Anthony G. Beck. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Balance Protocol podcast. I am Dr. Anthony G. Beck, and in today's show, I'm going to share with you a true story that I feel really has an amazing allegory about where we are in healthcare today and what we need to do to save ourselves from what I feel is a catastrophically damaging situation that's barreling right straight for us. And to drive that point home, uh, that sometimes the answer to our problems is often right there staring us in the face, but it takes some courage to stare right back at adversity and to have the internal fortitude to recognize where we are in a moment of truth and know what action to take. It's really tragic to think that so often the answer that we're looking for is right there, but in the moment, not being able to recognize it. I see this in working with patients all the time. They often know and admit that they have a health problem, but they get so focused on the forest that they can't see through the trees. So that brings me to a story that's actually very apropos and the backbone of today's show. This story I'm about to share with you is, in fact, a true story. Matter of fact, you can find it uh, in Wikipedia. The whole story and write-up there is really cool about Man Gulch, M-A-N-N Gulch. And this story was the subject of Norman McLean's uh, critically acclaimed book called Young Men and Fire, and it was also featured in a fabulous documentary that I mirror the show uh, after called Escape Fire. So if you'll go with me to a afternoon in August 1945, there was a fire that broke out in Montana in a place called Man Gulch. And there was a crew of 15 smoke jumpers who were in their 20s. And a couple were only 19, and with the youngest being 17 years old. Well, they parachuted in and were headed by a foreman by the name of Wagner Dodge. He was known as Wag or Wag Dodge. And he was actually the oldest of them all at a ripe old age of 33. And what had happened was that there was a a forest fire and it uh, exploded in its growth. And it was moving at over 600 feet a minute. And if you don't know, that's about six miles per hour. So no one can really sustain that pace and run faster than a fire going at that particular speed, being fed by winds and trying to run up the incline of a mountain. So the firefighters, they were trapped, needless to say. But Wag Dodge, in a moment of truth, had an idea. He knew that if they were going to try to run and just try to outspeed this fire, that that was a race that they were definitely going to lose. So in that moment of clarity, he stopped, he lit a match, and then he lit a fire at his own feet. And that fire began to burn all around him and consume the the forest in the general area. So you could imagine what the other guys were thinking who were with him. Who is this? old guy gone plumb crazy and is he out of his mind here we are fighting a fire and he's starting one right here so there they were with a huge fire already you know ripping down on him and he goes and starts something that they see as a threat but his idea was this if he burned the fuel around him and the fire comes and takes over him he'll be safe so this actually is the story behind what has become known as an escape fire Now, Wag Dodge, he tried to get the others to join with him and stay put, but nobody did. And the tragic part of the story is that fire overtook that crew and 
13 lives were lost, and it burned over 3,200 acres. Now, Wag Dodge, he survived nearly unharmed in his escape fire. And that fire continued to destroy just a beautiful forest for five more days before they were able to get it under control. So the U.S. Forest Service actually drew lessons from this particular tragedy of Man Gulch. And they designed new training techniques and safety measures that developed how the agency actually approached wildfire suppression. And the agency also increased emphasis on fire research and the science of fire behavior. So this location in Montana is actually even included in the historical as a historical district on the U.S. National Register of Historic Places. So again, it's amazing but tragic to see this image that the answers for us is sometimes right there, but in the moment, not being able to see it. This is due to people being so embedded in the status quo. And so many of us are programmed and conditioned this way because of our very limited exposure to anything else other than what we subject ourselves to seeing from day to day. And just like those young men who couldn't recognize the wisdom that Wag Dodge had, many people today can't recognize a invention or a therapy or something that would improve the health of so many when it's staring right there at them and they're next to it. And they can't consign themselves to doing anything different than what they've always done or give up their old habits. This is exactly what I say is the case in our healthcare today. We are in man gulch right now, and healthcare is headed for really bad trouble. In 2010, Congress passed healthcare reform, extending coverage to over 30 million Americans. And all I hear is how we're going to give access to more people to the present system. Well, the present system doesn't work. And in fact, it's my contention that it's going to take us down. And to me, you know, that's not the only issue, but I'm going to get more into that a little bit later in the show. We need a whole new kind of medicine. In the United States, we spent $7 trillion in health care in 2011. Health care reform was a good place to start, but it does very little to solve the root problem. Now, the tragic irony is the fact that health care reform was not written by the fire jumpers of medicine. It was written by politicians and manipulated by lobbyists. Now, don't get me wrong, this show is not going to be a, a political diatribe. Matter of fact, I'm not going to even get into any of that. This is because my entire intent of sharing with you today is how to see yourself setting your own escape fire to virtually show you how to completely opt out of our system of health care. The question cannot be, how do we provide more people with the same crappy care? The question must become, how do we cause less people to need care in the first place? The fact is, we don't have a health care system in this country. We have a disease management system. And 75% of health care costs go into treating chronic diseases. That's diseases that are chronic. This means that they're present over time and continuous. Many venues within science have proven and even agree that they are largely preventable. The fact is, most chronic diseases are largely preventable. I really want you to let that soak in and understand how important that is. So when I ask people, and I ask you to think for yourself right now, when you think of the image of providing health care to more people than we do now, what comes to mind? I ask because it's vital for our understanding and our vision to be the same, or at least very similar. Most people think health care in the acute mindset. This means you go see the doctor when you're sick, right? Well, that type of care is very rare, comparatively speaking, to chronic care. Now, if that just made your forehead wrinkle up, let me explain. The vast majority of healthcare expenditures are spent on people who are, quote-unquote, sick or have a disease that has been around for many months, if not years. This would be exampled by cardiovascular disease, diabetes, or asthma. It's not those people who have an acute condition or illness like a common cold, a cut, 
or a broken bone. Most have never even thought about this fact or even considered why it's so vital to understand the difference. The answer is not that we need more care. We have plenty of care. Virtually no one is without access to care. Think about it. Do you or even one person you know in this country not have a hospital or urgent care clinic within a reasonable drive or is without 911 phone call access or even an ambulance? The answer is no. We all have access to care. Now, when it comes to regular routine health visits, same thing. Do you or anyone you know not have a primary care medical office within a reasonable distance or time of travel? Well, of course we all do. The fact is, we all have this quote-unquote access. What the understanding here is, is people have been brainwashed to use the word access when they should be saying, pay for it. That's the aha moment. Uh, now the shoe really hits the floor. What people are wanting is to have health care paid for. No offense, but this is the dirty secret and politically incorrect fact that no one wants to or has the guts to call out. Well, of course, except me. You know, for those with low or constricted income, this can be and is a real issue for them. And personally, I get it. You know, I grew up poor and living in the country in a single wide trailer. I remember one time I was holding on the back of a, of a truck bed while my stepdad was driving and my brother and I were trying to see how fast we could run. Well, of course, I jumped up on the tailgate and when I didn't think I could run anymore, my brother held on. He kept running. I was like, well, he can't run faster than me. So I did something stupid and jumped back down. And of course, my feet didn't keep up with as fast as we were going. And I fell and I broke my arm. And we didn't have insurance and we were, you know, miles, you know, from a uh, healthcare or a hospital, but we got in the, in the truck and drove me and we patched up my arm and I was in a cast for weeks. So th the point is, is that if someone gets sick and goes to the doctor for healthcare, the question really comes down to is how are they going to pay for it? Now, I'm not going to give the answer yet and we'll definitely come back to it. But now that we've clarified the term access to care as to mean who's going to pay, now we can look at the real roots of the problem facing health care in our country. And people often think more or better health care has to be a new drug or a laser or a piece of equipment or something really high tech or even expensive to be powerful. They have a hard time realizing that simple choices we make in our lives each day can be even more powerful than any of the new fancy technologies, and they can make a huge difference in our life. We're in the grip of several very big industries, and they don't want to stop making money. At the executive level, what is most important is meeting Wall Street's expectations. You know, shareholders, they invest because they want to return on their investment. And they have to because for-profit companies are for profit. So I'm not opposed to that. I'm, I'm certainly an unapologetic capitalist. But at the same time, they forget that what they're doing is providing health care. And so again, our current health care system is unsustainable. We're spending twice as much in the United States as any other country in the world. We are really and truly mortgaging the future. Not just the health of health care, but the health of the nation. And in typical practices, physicians see people with chronic illness who are unable to afford things such as their medications, much less pay for the time they actually are spending learning on how to implement better health strategies. So therein lies the problem. It's that the government pays based on the number of patients they see not by the measure of how the patient gets better. Instead of basing things on outcomes, on how good of a job they're doing, the government, and when I say the government, I mean the governing bodies, insurance reimbursement companies, and uh, different constraints that are made by laws on how healthcare is, is uh, provided and what they can and can't do. They set the reimbursements completely on 
the number of patients that the doctor sees. This is one of the places where you're relegated to being only a number, just one homogenized drop in the uh, health nation water bucket. It doesn't matter how complicated the cases are, how much time is spent with the patient. It's They're just a number. That's patient one, two, three, four, and five. It forces doctors to have to play this game of what does this patient need versus how much time are they willing to spend with them based upon what's in it for me in the terms of financial reimbursement from the system. Ever wonder why typical doctor's offices, um, your visit goes a little something like this. You make an appointment weeks if not months in advance. You get to your appointment but still wait over an hour and then you see the doctor for 7.6 minutes and get only one complaint at a time. Want to know why that happens? Well, because you're a part of a numbers game and you might not even know it. The administration is telling them you have to see more patients. We're in the red. And when the doctor tries to buck the system, they begin to hound them by asking them, what do they have to do to get their productivity up? I know for me personally, I'm not interested in getting my productivity up. I'm interested in educating, motivating, and inspiring my patients. The true measure really comes from the outcome. Are your patients resolving disease? Are you helping them do that? The term doctor is Latin for teacher, and that's the, the, the art as opposed to the science that's really been lost in this sham of a healthcare system um, that we have today. In the age of disease management medicine, the time allowed to spend with a patient has shrunk down to where you have literally five to 7.6 minutes with them. That's a number that actually is, uh, is out there. <laughs> And it will get worse. I truly anticipate the concept of two-minute doctors. You will get truncated down to a checklist or a data collecting questionnaire, basically hoodwinked into doing all the detective work and checking boxes on a sheet of paper, and then you get dumped into a computer algorithm to spit out a diagnosis. The doctor is only going to be there to confirm you did the right box checking. So. Just like fast food joints, they want the time you walk into that box to the time you get your sack of food to be two minutes. And this is not the choice of the doctor. They are not the evil villains here. I promise you that. They are simply a byproduct of a forced environment. They're basically what I call hookers working for the pimp. And as a primary care provider myself, it's my job to make sure that patients don't get sick that they have everything they need to prevent and maintain health. But for the typical primary care doc, over their head in the current system, they're trapped in this revolving door. People come in and you try to fix just this one thing. They keep coming back for the same thing over and over, never getting to the bottom of what's causing all the problems that they're having. This may seem like they are coming in with an acute thing because they pop in and pop out. But the fact is, it's chronic. It's the same thing coming back over and over. And there's a few reasons for this cycle. Well, I've already mentioned one of them, and that's they only get that 7.6 minutes to spend with the patient. I mean, how the heck can anyone solve problems that fast? I guess this is a Jeopardy game show. And then number two, the solution that is given is virtually always the same. It's a little square white sheet of paper that you take down to a drugstore. And then, of course, three is the patients don't know that there's a different way, a better way. And I've seen patients that are just so depressed and on medications that they become suicidal, just wanting to end it, just so tired of being sick and tired. A great deal of what is known in conventional medicine is to put band-aids on things and to suppress symptoms. This is the problem with most of our suppressive treatments. They just keep the disease process going and even strengthen it over time. And more common than not, 
contributing to other diseases that become chronic because of what happens when you take these vast drug cocktails and your body doesn't really get the attention it needs to those true root causes from the beginning. And so it's a very uh, terribly vicious cycle. And this reminds me of back when I was in school and uh, I had a teacher who was on a budget and her budget didn't allow them to teach the way that they knew that they needed to. So they brought in supplies from home or the store that they paid for themselves. I saw it happen quite a few times, really made me uh, love my teachers. I, I really remember doing that, man. I must have been 8, 9, 10, 12-ish or something. And uh and you know, going to a school in the country in North Carolina. And I had teachers that would, uh, you know, say, guys, well, be mindful of the paper that you use and stop just filling up the garbage can because, you know, maybe you didn't know, but I had to pay for that. And I go, what? And they just humbly explained to me that they paid for it out of their own pocket. But anyhow, meanwhile, uh, I would think, you know, well, how come there's not enough funds to, to, to do what needs to be done? Uh, well, the, the teachers, of course, would never, you know, go into pointing the fingers. But I thought, would think to myself, well, I know the board is definitely getting a fat salary and benefits. But anyhow, don't get me started on that. You know, other doctors get mad and put pressure on doctors who don't see enough patients because they spend more time with them. Uh, you see this in group practices or hospital practices, big um, uh, cooperatives between physicians and things. There's definitely a uh, administrative meetings of who's doing what and who's producing more revenue based upon patient visits. Um, it's so much wiser to work at a deeper level, I feel though. And what I, it's actually called the rule of rigor. And we've all experienced this in our lives where we if realize if, if we only would take or would have taken the time to do it right from the beginning and apply that rule of rigor, where physicians are right now, patients are in a really desperate need of care. The way the system is set up, they just simply cannot be effective. They become doctors because they care about patients. They, we, we go to school and invest a tremendous amount of money and time and years not because we're going to think about how wealthy we're going to become, but we I would like to think that we all had that little inkling, that calling to make a difference in people's lives. Uh, just like music musicians or performers, they kind of feel called to that passion in life. Yet after a few short years in the system, they learn the dirty secret, and that is that most of them know that they can't truly help these patients. That's right. I actually just said it. They realize that they're not really helping them. Now, they're giving them care. They're being compassionate. But at the end of the day, are they really resolving these complaints? Are they coming back for the same complaints over time? Or are they truly um, resolving these complaints? And what, that's what I would define as helping them. I say that because I have been told this countless dozens of times by other physicians that what they are doing is helping, but only helping delay disease, not resolve or prevent it. I've talked to so many of my colleagues and they feel demoralized that they are getting, that they're not getting what they expected out of medicine. Uh, here's an experiment for you. Ask this question to any doctor you know. Say, Doc, hey, I got a question for you. Would you do this all over again knowing what you know now? There and you, you, it'll be interesting for you to see what answers you get. I'm not going to tell you what you'll get because there's a variety, but I think you'd be surprised. And ask them to a answer that honestly. There has to be a different way of doing things. And the great news is there is. We have good people, but a bad system. And good is the enemy to great I ask people I come in contact with all the time as part of my own investigation and I just, you know, we all have our little isms in the back of our head. I'll talk to people when they find out I'm a doctor and things and I'll say, so how is your doctor? And they'll generally say, they're okay or they're, I have a good doctor. I'll usually follow up with them with a, hmm, I said, and, and I'll just jokingly say, imagine if they were great. 
And sometimes they take it, you know, the right way and sometimes they don't. And they go, well, what are you saying? And I go, well, imagine if you had a doctor that actually really spent time with you and you didn't have to come back and manage a particular diagnosis. Uh, one, a doctor that would, you know, allow you to cry on their shoulder if, if, you, if you needed to or um, do a follow-up call personally after hours, things like that. You know, a great doctor. And they go, well, no, I don't think I've ever had that. That does sound great. The history of how American healthcare system grew uh, is not one of order. It's one of really a, a haphazard chaos. Everyone is doing what makes sense to them individually. You know, we pay hospitals to be full, so they try to keep them full. We pay doctors to see patients, so they see a lot of patients. We create this public expectation that more is better, which isn't actually true. But people, they'll seek more, and especially if you control their minds by marketing that healthcare is free and others are going to pay for it. You see, everybody is doing their jobs. We just design the jobs wrong. Physicians are well-intentioned. Uh, even when bad things happen, it's not because people have had bad intentions. It's because our system is all fouled up. We spend a spectacular amount of money on health care, just sheer numbers of $2.7 trillion per year. I mean, holy crap, Batman, almost $3 trillion a year. If, if more care is better, then why isn't care better? Why aren't chronic disease rates getting better? The average per capita of health care in the developed world is about $3,000. In the United States, it's about $8,000. That is one heck of a lot of money. Now think about that. That's per capita. That means the total number of dollars spent divided by the number of people. So did you get your $8,000 in healthcare value last year? You know, paying insurance is not getting healthcare. That's paying a bill and hoping you don't get sick not actually paying because you got sick. Our healthcare system is not affordable anymore. So who pays for that? Where does that money come from? This is all coming out of our pockets. It's your money. The really astonishing thing about us spending more is that we have worse outcomes. Now, if you need a very advanced cardiac procedure, you are in luck to be in this country. Rescue care is second to none. So yeah, acute care is really good here. Where we screw the pooch is chronic care. As an overall system, we're not even close to being the best in the world. I mean, just look at the results. Our lifespan is not even in the top 20. We're actually 50th. We have a disease care system and boy, is it profitable disease care system. If this system was honest with itself, it does not want you to die, nor does it want you to get well. It just wants you to keep coming back for the care of your chronic disease. Most of this huge effort of the healthcare industry is devoted to intervention in established disease, the majority of which is lifestyle related and preventable. To talk about how we shift away from disease intervention towards disease prevention and health promotion, that requires a massive rethinking of medicine and health care at all levels of society. And to be blunt, it starts with you. It has to do with expectation of patients. It has to do with training of physicians. And it will require a huge effort. Today is that day you become part of that shift in effort. There is this innate healing capacity that we all have. When I sit with a person who is not well, it's always at the back of my mind the questions of what is blocking the healing? What do we have to remove? What is missing? You know, what do we need to add? These perspectives are missing from healthcare today. It's missing because of the training of our healthcare providers. It's because it does not fit its central dogma. And that's a true term, by the way, central dogma. Today's conventional medicine is only asking, 
what do we name this disease? And regardless of the name we're going to blame it on, um, that is just the way life goes. Then they ask, how are we going to tame this name disease with a pill or a scalpel? What is wrong with medical education is that it simply does not address whole subject areas that are absolutely essential to understanding human beings, health, illness, and treatment. You know, one that is overtly obvious is nutrition, which is virtually omitted from all medical training. Then there's the real irony because we have commercials that say, doctor recommended or ask your doctor. And I always go, really? <laughs> Why would I go ask them about nutrition? They're just not trained in it. I mean, that's a fact. I mean, it's, it's not a put down. And the, the fact is, if they have nutritional training, it's definitely outside of their medical uh, perspective. They don't prescribe nutrition. They will you know, shuffle you off to uh, a dietitian or something of that nature. Well, then why don't we say, ask your dietitian? <laughs> so if you want to know something about nutrition, good heavens, don't ask your doctor. And I know many people are going to give me flack for that, but you know, if you can tell me why that would actually be wise and practical, I'd, I'd be more than willing to hear about it. Well, unless of course they're a functional medicine or an integrative medicine doctor like myself, uh -huh. but um, we need to expose physicians with a broader way of seeing patients. A deeper understanding of healing and a, give them a larger toolbox in which to choose therapies. But you know as well as I do, it's not going to happen if it does not monetize. Many physicians come to my preceptor program uh, to learn functional medicine and my balance protocol, uh, how to implement it into clinical practice and basically wean themselves out of managed care. And they come to me and they're overworked, overwhelmed, buried deep in. Um, insurance forms, seven-minute patient encounters, and they're seeing 30 patients a day. There are trends in healthcare that make them really uncomfortable, and they state that they feel that there has got to be something different, something better. You know, let's face it, it's indisputable that medical training today is focused on giving pharmaceutical medications or expensive tests to treat the conditions after they occur. They have no idea on how to prevent things like heart attacks, stroke, fatigue, insomnia, allergies. I've offered hundreds a ray of hope on how things can be done differently, and now I offer it to patients. In Western medicine, all of our effort is based on dispelling evil. It boils down to if someone has an infection, we give them an anti-infective agent. If someone has hypertension, we give them antihypertensives. If someone states that they're depressed, we give them an antidepressant. We do nothing for supporting the good. The body can and wants to be healthy. Both of these approaches are necessary, but it would be great if we had better balance. The kinds of interventions we have come to embrace in this country are inherently costly because they are dependent on expensive technology. This includes pharmaceutical drugs. I think there are some very good drugs out there. I think drug treatment has its place. I'd take a pharmaceutical drug myself if I needed to. But what I'd love to see implemented is to try to change the mindset that has completely taken hold on both sides, both doctors and patients. And that is that drugs are the only legitimate way to treat disease. I mean, where did that idea come from? Ever notice that anything that is not a drug or an AMA standard is quote unquote pseudoscience or snake oil? I mean, these people that say those statements will always use those same words in, in rapid uh, succession and call other people quacks and things. Uh, it's pretty crazy until time proves that the, the therapies that they disregarded actually become mainstream and accepted and now they're actually medicine. So anyhow, if you ever hear someone say a term like that, you have to thank them for singling themselves out as the true fools that they are because correct-minded people don't speak like that. They respectfully disagree and issue sound rebuttal and debate. It reminds me of the movie Hitched. I don't know if, if, if you've seen that movie where Alfred uh, is with his high-class girlfriend at this stuffy party and these guys come over and everything they talk about, they put it down. They mention something, go, yep, hated it. And 
it, it's very similar in that regard. I see a lot of those people, no matter what, if it's not in that central dogma, this acute care model, if it's anything that challenges that status quo whatsoever, they mock it. People and doctors who say crap like Tin Hat and Quack, they're really just like those goofballs in that movie Hitch. And what an absolute crock of crap. You know, anyway, here is why they have no place to be acting like that. You know, we spend $300 billion a year on pharmaceuticals alone. That is almost as much as the rest of the world combined. Is that not crazy? You know, in, in, in the 1950s, America was at about 10% of the rate that we are now. Just look at what is on TV every day, like for heartburn. Why do we need to wait? We can just take a pill right now. And then you'll see Simbacort and Cymbalta and Lipitor and Plavix, Concerta. And then if that's not enough, we'll add on another one in Abilify. And we always give them these really cool names and these narratives with actors in, in the commercials. And then, of course, everyone's so mesmerized and uh, about the, the vision that this vast advertising and marketing campaign uh, backed by millions of dollars to create this image. They're not reading that little paragraph at the bottom or that rapidly speaking you know, announcer at the end of how awful and how many diseases they're going to create after doing it. But, you know, half of all ads are for drugs. You got to notice that all the people who are actors, by the way, all the fancy marketing and mind programming uh, to get your brainwashed into what they're saying. And they give you this sales pitch and ask you to ask yourself if, if now after seeing or watching their programming, do you think that this drug, you know, get this, is right for you? And then they tell you to go ask your doctor. So the whole system is designed to cause you to think, do I need this particular drug? And I'm going to fuel the system by sending you back in for it. And all of these drugs are really for, you know, chronic conditions, things that keep continuing to happen. You don't have commercials for, here's this, uh, this gauze or this bandage wrap or this stitching material or this cast for your broken arm. You don't see <laughs> commercials for that kind of stuff. You see it for drugs for chronic conditions. Am I the only one who recognizes this? I, I wonder sometimes. So yeah, no, no one really hears the statement that they're required by law to say at the end of the commercial. The one that tells you that all, you know, about all these other diseases that can be caused if you take this medication. Want to know why they don't mind saying all that confession? Well, it's because it's just now going to justify you having another drug for the diseases that this one can cause. The newest trend is the, if you need help with your prescription, you know, assistance may be available. Contract such and so pharmaceutical company and we can help you out with that. So uh, it's a very interesting dynamic when it comes to how they're pushing and promoting these medications. Now imagine if they use this approach with the other half of what I, what make up commercials, you know, attorneys, right? Oh wait, they actually do do that. <laughs> you, you've heard of them all. You know, have you or a loved one been injured by drug such and such? If so, call the law offices of such and such and see if we can leverage you to get us paid. I mean, come on. None of this happens in Canada, the UK, France, or Germany, just for a couple examples. The only other country that does it is New Zealand. It's the only one that allows you to, uh, other than the United States, to advertise prescription drugs. So what does that do? Well, it drives demand, just like any other advertisement. Same thing for cars, fast foods, <laughs> and attorneys. Ads always end up with the same uh, phrase. Ask your doctor if this is right for you. And people do. And doctors wanting to please their patients will often prescribe it. We have a national dependency on drugs. Over-medicating is a huge problem. Now, a lot of my patients are in the military and special forces uh, operators and things like that and their families, and I have found that the military is really no exception. The military can kind of be seen as a microcosm of the problem that society is having today in that soldiers are prescribed so many magic medications that that amount has tripled in the last five years. The Army even admits that this is all linked to the rising number of soldier suicides. More soldiers are dying from non-combat injuries than from combat during war. 
So th- there's a seeming contradiction bestowed upon their caregivers. You know, they're told they need to keep the patient pain free, and they're going to do that. But they have to know that the, that there are points in time where they have to say enough is enough. The challenge is to find the right mix of treatments for our nation's military. Uh, it doesn't take a genius to know that the answer is not in a sack of pills. Yet this is what it is today. When lost in the system, people become invisible. I want to take them out of this darkness personally and just make them take them from invisible to invincible. That's what I'm looking to do. And I'm you know, hoping to have you who's, who are listening to this show today to think, well, how can I do that? How can I opt out? How can I exempt myself from that type of care really to turn you from just an invisible number to an invincible human being with just vibrant vitality. And through uh, my passion and and, and what I'm doing, I'm I'm really hoping that that's going to be the outcome that uh, I'll be able to do. You know, in, in, in the 10 years of wars, the amount of suffering in the military has been enormous uh, when you go to a war zone and get injured or see your buddy injured, it's going to tax anyone. And, you know, you, you, you get these, um, you know, injuries that affect you mentally. And, and of course, your body gets injured. And currently, the approach is to pain and depression and psychological dysfunction is to give medications. Here's the problem, um, incidentally, with treating pain. There, there's no thermometer to stick in and say, oh, you have this much pain. They have to treat our military with whatever they state. In other words, you know, same thing for in the civilian world. We have to go on the subjective statements made by the patient when it comes to their level of pain. And believe me, pain meds will always tell you that you need more. (laughs) That is what I call the dark matter of medicine. Dark matter is a discovery by astronomers that there's a huge amount of the universe that we can't see. It's not visible, but we know it's there. In some ways, I think of what is in healthcare as dark matter. It's unseen, but it's there. And it's very, very powerful. We tend to just see the light of our current healthcare system, uh, just the, the goodness of it, the potential for helping. What we see all the time in the news is that the latest and greatest pill or, you know, what this surgery is or a piece of equipment. But the more you look, the more you'll find that there is all this stuff in medicine that we don't think about that is actually harmful. You know, there was a team from Dartmouth that mapped healthcare payments, and they found some very disconcerting differences from one part of the country to the other. For example, back in 2007, a recipient in Miami uh, tallied up to more than $15,000 in healthcare bills, where at the same time, a recipient in, say, it was Minneapolis, only cost half that, or $7,500. It was not because the procedures were more expensive in Miami. What the study showed was that patients in places like Miami were receiving more care, more tests, more drugs, more time in the hospital, more invasive operations, even though the patients were not any sicker than their counterpart. But so what, right? The the common thought is, is we want more specialists. We want more procedures. We want more tests, or at least we think we do. Well, that's the problem. Because what we think is best for us is oftentimes not. Well, if you're a parent, you know that argument all too well. Why? Well, remember back to the commercial thing. We are told we need things. What the Dartmouth researchers discovered was that these patients in the most costly regions where Medicare spent more money on patients, those patients did not have better outcomes. In fact, they were worse and more likely to die. If you look at healthcare in America, you're twice as likely to get your knee replaced than you are in other countries. You're three times more likely to have a heart cath or a stent. We have set up a system that often pushes physicians and hospitals to do more, driven by perverse economic incentives. We are doing a ton of procedures to people that they simply do not need. To 
a carpenter with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So, of course, these physicians who are trained and educated to do these procedures are going to look at things and going to want to do them. But there has to be some constraint, a better system of approach to why the patient may need or not need those particular procedures. Because the fact is people are actually getting younger and younger who are having heart attacks and diseases that have long been considered uh, aging diseases, kind of like osteoporosis. I've had these heart disease patients go to doctors because they thought, I'll just get this fixed and I'll get better and things won't be bad anymore. But they get on that roller coaster of a cath and then a stent and then a cath and then a stent. You know, my own mother experienced this. I watched her go through that until their doc says, there is nothing else I can do for you. Contrary to popular belief, getting a stent in a mm. coronary artery uh, it will relieve chest pain, but it will not help you live longer. And it will not protect you from having a heart attack. It only reduces symptoms. Did you know that? And the problem with some of those procedures is that, way, is that they will lead to bad outcomes. So people start doing research into where do they go for the best care for their disease. Now keep in mind the vast majority are for chronic disease, not acute disease. So they go to WebMD, Mayo, or Cleveland Clinic, all places that have great branding and huge marketing budgets, name recognition, not because they are resolving chronic disease, not because they're known for this huge positive stream of outcome and people who've sought their care and their programs are now disease-free. That's not what their, their accolades are for, but because they have big advertising budgets. They're able to make a name for themselves. And again, it comes down to that uh, sociologically uh, you know, uh, programmed mindset. When you reward physicians for doing procedures instead of talking to patients, that is what they're going to do, procedures. And they're going to convince you that that is what needs to be done. And the vast majority of you out there just fall in line like sheeple. Ask yourself, or a family member for that matter, how much personal research they seek outside of their own, on their own, before okaying to a surgery or before they took that particular drug? Or did you just trust in your physician, go down to the drugstore and have them give you that bottle and you start putting it, you know, down your throat? The vast majority of doctors in this country are paid by a fee for procedure system. Now catch what I just said. I use the term fee for procedure, not fee for service, although that is what's used. But in reality, there's no service being done, only procedures. Cardiologists, they get paid for cracking your chest open. Radiologists, they get paid for zapping you in some big tunnel machine. Gastroenterologists, they get paid for blowing up your bowel and shoving a camera up in there. If a doctor spends 15 minutes with you, they get paid 15 bucks. If they spend 15 minutes with you and then put in a stint, they get paid $1,500. To spend 45 minutes with a patient to make sure they're doing their exercises and eating correctly and trying to figure out the real problem, they get paid 35 bucks. You, you, you see where the math is? It's a completely irrational system. So this type of system rewards them for doing more, more procedures, not spending more time with the patient, not on outcomes, just doing more. It does not reward them for doing better or keeping you healthy. The Institute of Medicine did a report in 2011 and it said that 30% of healthcare spending, so that's roughly $750 billion annually, is wasted and does not improve health. Wow, what a huge amount. $750 billion every year wasted and does nothing to improve patients' health. Although we have made progress technologically, we know how to do things for disease that we didn't know before and that we haven't really experienced the systemic improvement that we want, even though we do have this progress in technology. We actually pay for fragments of care. A doctor's visit or a hospital stay, a lab test, an ambulance trip, 
because we pay for pieces, we get pieces. So people who really need a coordinated system, they don't get that. Medicine is very um, linear uh, or siloed. Uh, it's very specialized. And this is a really big problem when you go to the hospital because there are so many people who lay their hands on you and if they're not really talking to each other, you don't get the best diagnosis. You get repeated tests. You get things happening to you that puts you in harm's way because no one is really keeping track of you as a person. A recent study found that 187,000 people die each year from harmful care in hospitals. Now, based on these numbers, it puts it at the third leading cause of death in the United States. Number one being heart disease, number two being cancer, number three is medical error and hospital acquired infections. That's more than number stroke at number four and uh, respiratory diseases at number five. I mean, this can't be the American way. Emergency rooms are filled with chronic condition patients that either go untreated or are treated, but um, by the mill I spoke of earlier. The natural endpoint is going to be the emergency room. You see, there is access and plenty of it. And everybody, and I mean everybody, has access to health care. But don't confuse access with pay for it or even convenience, actually. So access is a term that's confusing. It really comes down to the money. It would be so wonderful if these chronic conditions could be treated by the early detectors or these primary care docs, the first people that you see. Uh, there is a saying in medicine that 20% account for 80% of the cost, and the majority of those costs are when they are, are repeatedly hospitalized. Remember, hospitals get paid when their rooms are full. Doctors keep their hospital privileges based on a quota for admitting patients. Bet you didn't know that. I mean, why would you need hospital privileges if you're not using the hospital, right? One of the ways I think about saving money in healthcare is to focus our energies on those 20% and treat them in a more effective way. We are in a culture of abundance, and you get what you want when you want it and right away. The only thing people fear is inconvenience, and that being applied to health care just doesn't work. Most diseases do not happen overnight, and it never sends you a notice in the mail. The roots of disease are found in what you have access to and that you repeat every day. So I'm going to say it. It's your fault. I know that stings a little bit, but it's true. You know, Hippocrates said, let food be your medicine and your medicine your food. That is the best place to start. But most people are under the complete false impression that eating healthy is more expensive. This is categorically false. As a society, we have to make it easier and more affordable to make the best lifestyle changes. However, what we really need to do is stop lying to people. Low fat, no yolks, you have to be vegetarian, you gotta eat like a caveman. I mean, give me a freaking break. Wanna think about something interesting. I've noticed the rise of convenience stores and drug stores. It's another little interesting phenomenon on quarters. Um, I mean, what the heck is going on with uh, CVS and Walgreens? Ever look inside of those stores, the food? Uh, why are these places on so many corners just like fast food joints? Um, it, it really is an interesting uh, dynamic that I've noticed. You, 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 just like you can't go a couple of miles without a McDonald's, you can't go a couple of miles without a drugstore. And drugstores aren't just drugstores. Now they're sundries and all kinds of fun things to, to get you in that uh, shopping mood. It's just a, uh, an interesting psychology there. So people eat what is most available and what is cheap, not what's good for them. McDonald's uh, will put a salad on the menu. Not that they're any healthier because they're not, if you've seen these salads. But have you noticed the price? $6 for a salad, but a burger is 99 cents. I mean, what the heck, right? If you're on a fixed income, what are you going to do? 
remember when we talked about the commercials being uh, half drugs? Well, the other half are fast foods or attorneys. I mean, isn't that profound? It's scary how obese uh, our country is and how, you know, what I call diabetes is, is spreading uh, throughout our country. It leads to all the top killers we mentioned earlier, and th that is a fact. If trends continue through 2020, up to a fifth of healthcare spending, or $1 trillion annually, will be devoted to treating the consequences of obesity. If you really want to understand how Americans are getting more and more overweight, it's because we have not rethought things that were put in place a long time ago when no one really thought about what the unintended consequences would be. The Department of Agriculture subsidizes all the wrong foods. They subsidize corn. They subsidize wheat. We don't subsidize any vegetables at all, uh, or fruit for that matter, or nuts and seeds. If you want to point the finger, let's, let's do it at a guy named Earl or uh, Rusty Butts. <laughs> That's his true name. He was with the Agricultural Administration under Nixon, and he was the guy who thought we should subsidize commodities. And this is because it would allow us to sell things on the international markets. We have made a heck of a lot of money doing it too. The problem is the international world doesn't eat like Americans, and that plan didn't quite work out. So they decided to pawn this new money-generating commodity on the American people. But how are they going to do that? Well, it's real easy. Tell people to eat 8 to 12 servings of whole grains a day. The other reason is because of political lobbies. The monies involved end up being funneled towards Congress, and Congress does not want to fix it because they want those monies from those lobbies that are giving that message of commodities and the economies of scale that it brings to it are all these beneficial things and politicians want to keep feeding into that system. So we have an entrenched system. The American healthcare system is generating rivers of money and it's going only into the pockets uh, of just a handful of people. The pockets of medical devices, the drug companies, the insurance companies, and the owners of those pockets don't want any changes. People go in and out of health care plans. They may only be a member of a plan for a year or so. And so this means the insurance company has no incentive to make a lot of investment in them as it relates to this plan. It uh, just does not work out for them financially. The only way to make money is to charge more for the policies. Insurance companies can regulate their rates as much as they want to. The average U.S. salary versus health insurance premiums from 1999 to 2009, if we take a look at those, salaries are up 38% and premiums are up 131%. Now, this is from the Institutes of Medicine. So let's compare that to other prices as if they grew as quickly um, since you know 1945. Eggs would be $55, milk would be $48, and oranges, a dozen of them or so, would be $134. They have forgotten that what they're doing is providing health insurance. It's all about the numbers and how many billions in profits. Do you know what insurance companies are? Most don't. They're investment companies. They take your premiums and they invest it in the market. Now, I told you what that market is. That market are things like pharmaceutical drugs, commodities, and things like that. So you can kind of see how people are scratching each other's backs. Our forefathers in medicine were all about patients, and it was all about healing. But when medicine slash disease became a big business, we lost our moral compass. And I feel we have gotten into a great deal of trouble because of that. Remember that drug Avandia? Well, it was fast-tracked by the FDA, and it was massively marketed. And by 2006, this drug became the largest selling diabetes drug in the world. $4 billion a year went into the pockets of GlaxoSmithKline. Trial after trial showed more heart attacks in the Avandia groups. 
it was so consistent, you didn't even have to be a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. About a 30% increase in heart attacks, and the company did nothing. They didn't even tell doctors. Not the FDA, not patients. The leading cause of death in diabetes is heart disease, 70% of all those deaths. Having a drug that increases the risk by 30% is criminal. Finally, a Senate investigation led to a severe restriction on the use of Avandia from the FDA, and they set aside $6 billion to settle lawsuits. And so in 2012, they agreed to plead guilty for failing to disclose safety data on Avandia as part of a $3 billion settlement. Well, if you do the numbers, the rest of the years at $4 billion a year, well, that was just gravy. So uh, they can get away with that type of behavior because it only costs them $3 billion because they're making billions more every year. It's, it's a crazy thing to think about it. And the FDA stated that almost 300,000 deaths were due to this drug. But you never heard of those numbers before, have you? It, it wasn't in the news. You didn't get to hear a, a lot of that. It's near impossible to get legislative action to improve the FDA and better regulate the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, there's this misnomer that people who run government are the elected officials, and this is simply not the case. The power lies with the corporations and the lobbyists that they buy. Matter of fact, here's some of the um, statistics when it comes to um, where the money comes from, because after all, it's a, it's a true adage that you just simply say is, you know, follow the money. So according to the Center for Responsive Politics, federal health care lobbying from 2009 to 2010, the American Hospital Association gave almost $40 billion. The American Health Insurance Plans gave almost $20 million. The American Medical Association, about $43 million, a little bit over. And the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, almost another $50 million. So total spending was $1.1 billion. Do you think these companies would spend this money if they were not getting much, much more expected returns? Uh, it's an expensive world we live in. And in terms of getting your voice heard in D.C., well, that's super expensive. But that is the whole function of what they call advocacy. And what gives lobbyists the tremendous amount of power is that they have this money that they have for campaign contributions. It's a, it's a fact. And we've been trying to reform health care for over 100 years. Uh, this goes all the way back to Teddy Roosevelt. But these companies will do whatever it takes to make sure there are no new laws or regulations that will hinder their profits. The 107th Congress had a bill, 1052, called the Bipartisan Patient Protection Act, or Patient Bill of Rights, during the Clinton administration. The lobbyists tried so hard to fight that law because it expanded the patient's ability to sue their insurance company or employer if they had been denied needed coverage. So a front group called the Health Benefits Coalition for Choice and Quality was formed. Now, what's in a name, huh? Sounds real beneficial, but they're very clever in using, um, skillfully picking these names so they really make people think that they're grassroots and they're really nothing of the kind. So part of the plot is to ultimately get people to vote against their own self-interest. So... In this case, they were sold the BS that if this act passes, that insurance premiums will skyrocket because of frivolous lawsuits. People had no idea they were being made to believe this by the insurance industry. There was bipartisan support. McCain and Kennedy were co-sponsors. But it was so opposed by the powerful insurance industry. The Washington Post printed articles like, Lobbyists spend millions to influence health care and as health reform uh, efforts intensified, hospitals seek to protect the bottom line. And then Financial Times printed, Health Insurance Lobby Attacks Reform. These companies will literally do anything it takes to make sure that any new law will not hinder their profits. And no bill was ever passed until almost a decade later. And now enters the Obamacare. And the Health Reform Act achieved the healthcare industry's two main objectives. Number one, the mandate that we'll all have to buy their coverage. And then two, make sure um, there wasn't a public 
option. The, they didn't want a new competitor. They had to live with some of the new consumer protections in the bill, uh, and, and that make and some of them like it makes it illegal to deny someone a policy because of a pre-existing condition. What the insurance industry's objective is now is to weaken those consumer protections over time and try to influence how the law is being implemented. Because so much money is involved, getting people to do what the right thing for American people uh, has become extremely difficult. And so I call this throwing a different pitch. People hit the pitch we throw. Uh, If we change the pitch... They will hit that one too. Between the health care we have and the health care we could have is a gap. It's actually a huge chasm. The secret is we have to change what makes sense. If we think our civilian health care system is smoldering or burning out of control and is unsustainable because of the costs, uh, just look at the military system. It has been fully engulfed for over a decade, a huge burning platform. The cost is going through the roof and the ability to help these service members and their families recover and repair is getting less and less. Fifteen years ago, a consensus study was done at the National Institutes of Health. They asked, uh, do we have good evidence if acupuncture uh, is safe and effective for uh, conditions? The answer was absolutely. And Fifteen years later, you can't walk into your average hospital and get acupuncture. The problem isn't that it doesn't work. It's that they haven't figured out how to get it into the system so they can make it widely available to the population and make money on it. Now, cardiologists go to medical school and learn to crack open chests and bypass arteries and then zip people up and send them on their way and tell them that they're cured. And then these patients go home and eat the same and exercise the same, which is to say that they actually don't. They smoke. They don't manage stress. They get this little white slip of paper that they can turn into a yellowish orange bottle magically at any drugstore. Well, guess what? Those bypasses just clog up. So then they cut them open again and bypass their bypass. Greatest business model I've ever seen. There has to be a better way. You see, medicine spends all this time mopping up the floor of the sink that is overflowing without thinking to turn off the faucet. Turning off the faucet is treating the underlying causes of disease. These are causes that are virtually all preventable. This is our lifestyle. Our bodies have remarkable abilities to heal themselves. These chronic diseases can not only be resolved, but prevented entirely and much more quickly than you realize. Here's an example that I think will blow your mind. Even in science, we have uh, all seen the proverbial lab rats or monkeys or pigs, whatever the case may be. Science and research puts them on these diets that force them to get fat, induce diabetes, or let them breathe things like cigarette smoke and give them lung cancer. They put them under emotional stress and not let them exercise. Now, here's where it gets absolutely felonious. They reverse those things and the diseases go away. So why the heck are we treating people any different? Now, when you do things that are not being done, it's not going to be universally acceptable. I see huge amounts of resistance, even ad hominem attacks, because I'm not a conventionally trained medical doctor or a part of that healthcare system. And because I use functional medicine or integrative medicine methods, um, I'm called radical in my methods. And I go, radical, really? Like having your chest buzz sawed open isn't radical. We have to empower people to change their lifestyle. Then comes the who's going to pay for it trap. If we made it reimbursable and changed the system on how docs are rewarded for outcomes and not for procedures, uh, then we would really have on our hands a huge shift towards a positive status. Heart and blood vessel disease kills more than all other diseases combined, yet we treat it with stents and angioplasty, bypass surgery, and what does the evidence show? 
Unless you're in the middle of a heart attack, our system does nothing for you. What we use shows that 95% of cases that they do not prolong life and they don't even prevent heart attacks. But I have a model that works. And that model is very simple and easy to implement in the patient's life, but yet it's not monetized very well in the medical system that we have now. And that is spend time with the patient, educate the patient, motivate the patient, and inspire the patient. Encourage them to make dynamic changes in their lifestyle, in how they eat, get adequate rest, simple things that when you shut off all that noise and confusion and really get down to what we all know internally truly works and encourage them to really go after those things that they have control in their lifestyle, that's when the magic happens. And do you want reimbursement? Here's the reimbursement. A life that is longer and filled with deeper levels of quality. There you go. Doesn't have to have a money price tag put on it because um, so many of us have had loved ones that have passed away and we'll find ourselves saying, I'd give anything for just one more day. How about more than just one day? How about years? I don't want people to have to wait anymore for scientific trial series to tell them that they can prevent and resolve disease. Why the heck should we be waiting for these jack wagons who have been failing miserably for decades to figure it out? We already know. What they are doing is getting caught up on the fallacy of the scientific method. They are trying to prove something that doesn't need proving. We know it empirically already. That they should, what they should be doing is proving that what they do doesn't work. And there is a huge difference. You know, prove to me that you love your spouse. You know, get my point? Everybody can agree that healthful, wholesome, real food is the center of what you should be eating. We all accept that our body should be moving and exercising. We all know we should get adequate rest. This is where the simple focus of things should be, but we have to get back to patient-centered care, not disease-centered care. There was even uh, a doctor, uh, Elizabeth Blackburn, she won a Nobel Prize in medicine, and she did a study that uh, stress produces shorter telomeres. So um, as soon as your telomeres get shorter, your life gets shorter. Well, telomeres are the ends of chromosomes, and chromosomes all have our genetic material on them. She proved that when these tips of this genetic material got worn down or frayed, the genetic materials got messed up. Uh, and that prevents tissues from renewing themselves in the body and disease takes hold. Remember back to biology, most things go both ways. So, if bad things make your telomeres shorter, maybe good things will make them longer. And science, at, you know, after this, uh, you know, proved that lifestyle modifications actually, in fact, indeed, lengthened your telomeres. Matter of fact, it turned on over 500 genes that prevent disease and turned off genes that promote cancer of the breast and prostate, just to name a couple. Even pharmaceuticals uh, has not been able to ever show that. That's no surprise, right? The, The interventions needed to do this are at a fraction of the cost, and the only side effects are good ones. In 2008, primary care physicians earned about half as much as specialists. We don't reward those on the front lines. We got into this hole because we got lied to. You got lied to and you believed it. I want to wake up everyone to the fact that the same people and system who made this mess keep us in this mess. And they're the same ones telling people uh, bullcrap like, Eat egg whites, eat low fat, and eat 10 to 12 servings of grains a day. These are all lies. And half of Americans will be diabetic or at least pre-diabetic in the next 10 years. And you got to ask, well, why? Why? Well, because people think things like the food guide pyramid is the truth. 
It's actually called my plate now. But the funny thing is most people don't know they changed it and they still think pyramid. Uh, that low salt and low fat and drugs is how you be healthy. These are lies. I mean, they're just dang lies. We call it health care, but it's not. It's sick care. It's disease care. We don't need health care reform. We need sick care reform. Uh, we need to begin to... Uh, pay on outcomes, not on volume. And just imagine if that happened. See, doctors have no skin in the game with you. They're getting paid regardless of how well you do. So here is how you exempt and opt out of all that crappy system. Number one, recognize that you and only you are in control of your well-being. Your choices are what impacts you. It's not that your genes or what runs in the family that sets your health's destiny. Science has overwhelming consensus that lifestyle is the largest determining factor for preventing disease in the first place. Number two, realize that you simply don't have to just take the level of health care you're dished out. You can and should hold your caregivers to the highest standards of quality. You can question them, disagree with them, and if you meet more resistance than you feel you're comfortable with, fire them and find one who will give you the respect that you deserve. Remember, more care is not better care. Better care is care that produces great outcomes. And number three, take solid corrective actions in your life. This will come when you get educated on real health truths, not by listening to all the noise and confusion from the info space. Listen to real clinicians and learn to sort through the fads and recycled internet content. And no matter who you listen to, me included, question and research. Always be on the quest for what applies to you as a category of one. When you get control of your health and make it valuable to yourself again, you will never let the disease care system apply to you. Essentially, this is how you create your own escape fire. Well, I hope you enjoyed this podcast as much as I enjoyed making it with you today. I really appreciate you listening. To join the Balanced Nation and for more information on how to get educated on the true root causes of disease, get motivated to take solid corrective action in your life, and get inspired to the highest levels of well-being, please head over to my website, DrAnthonyGbeck.com. You can also find me on Facebook.com forward slash DrAnthonyGbeck. And lastly, if you would be so kind as to take a few seconds and leave me a review on iTunes, I sure would love you for it. And until next time, remember, let's live life in balance. Wait, don't stop listening yet. Thank you for listening to the Balance Protocol podcast. Be sure to head over to dranthonygbeck.com where you'll find lots of life-changing information that will educate, motivate, and inspire you to your highest levels of well-being. There, you can get access to exclusive content as well as download your 100% free Urgent Health Report. You can also use the contact page to ask your health questions and make requests for topics you would like covered on future podcasts. Until then, let's live life in balance.